We will now discuss a very high yield area for the step two, pancreatitis. The two most common causes of pancreatitis in the United States are gallbladder stones and alcoholism. Drug allergy is another important cause. Sulfa drugs such as furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide have been implicated. Ductal obstruction secondary to ERCP or cystic fibrosis is also common. Trauma, as in the case of car accidents, is also another cause of pancreatitis. Hypertriglyceridemia and hypercalcemia are also causes. Infection in cases of sepsis have also been linked to acute pancreatitis. If you're really unlucky, a scorpion sting can also do it. Lastly, drug toxicity such as pentamidine, didanazine, azathioprine, and estrogen use has also been linked to the formation of acute pancreatitis. If you see a patient with acute epigastric pain, tenderness on palpation, and nausea and vomiting, he has acute pancreatitis. Keep in mind the pain intensity is subjective and doesn't correlate with the degree of organ damage. Patients with full-blown, severe pancreatitis may experience a very little bit of pain, while a patient with a focal, small section pancreatitis might be bouncing off your bed. Keep in mind, with the very severe cases, it may accompany hypotension and fever. One little tip for you. When patients describe the pain, they're going to say it goes straight back through into their back like a spear being stabbed into their abdomen. Do not confuse this with cholecystitis. Cholecystitis pain goes around the side into the back. The only other pain that radiates into the back, but it's described as tearing or ripping, is acute aortic dissection. Which of the following is associated with the worst prognosis in pancreatitis? Is it an elevated amylase, an elevated lipase, the intensity of the pain, low calcium, or C-reactive protein that's rising? If you chose D, low calcium, you are correct. Severe pancreatic damage decreases lipase production and release, leading to fat malabsorption in the gut. Calcium then binds with the fat, called saponification, in the bowel, leading to calcium malabsorption. Let's talk about the wrong answer choices. Although amylase and lipase are elevated in pancreatitis, there is no correlation with the height of these enzyme levels and disease severity. Intensity of the pain, this is subjective and never predicts anything. And C-reactive protein will be elevated with all forms of inflammation, therefore it's nonspecific. The best initial diagnostic test is an elevated amylase and lipase level. The most specific diagnostic test is a CT scan. Other labs, such as a CBC, will show leukocytosis and a drop in hematocrit over time with rehydration. Remember, when they present to you, they are severely volume depleted and are hemoconcentrated. You may see an elevated LDH and AST level. Some of these patients may have hypoxia because of imminent ARDS. Others will have hypocalcemia due to fat malabsorption. And lastly, some may show an elevated urinary trypsinogen activation peptide level. As we mentioned, imaging is the most specific diagnostic test. CT or MRI scan are best because they also detect pseudocysts. Pseudocysts develop four to six weeks after a bout of acute pancreatitis. ERCP can help to determine the etiology, such as stones, a stricture, or even a tumor. But don't forget, ERCP is also a cause of acute pancreatitis. A plain, flat x-ray of the abdomen, well, it could show you a sentinel loop of bowel this is an air-filled piece of small bowel on the left upper quadrant, but has extremely limited utility, and we never do it. An ultrasound has very poor accuracy. Why? Because you have overlying bowel that blocks precise imaging of the pancreas and therefore reduces the accuracy of ultrasound. Here's a classic abdominal CT scan performed with IV and oral contrast to better define and outline the abdominal structures. Note the inflammation around the area of the pancreas. The treatment of acute pancreatitis has not changed in 30 years. The first step is to make the patient NPO, that means nothing by mouth. The next step is aggressive IV hydration. These patients are leaders behind in fluid depletion, therefore you must hydrate them and you must hydrate them quickly. The next step is analgesia. Control the pain. These patients will not take deep breaths and will hypoventilate and retain CO2. But if you control the pain, they'll take deep breaths and gas exchange can occur. 
If they're having nausea or vomiting, also consider an antiemetic. Lastly, consider a PPI. They're going to be under a lot of stress. They have decreased pancreatic stimulation from the acid entering the duodenum. So get a PPI to protect their stomach. If you see more than 30% necrosis on the CT or MRI, you must add an antibiotic such as imipenem. Infected necrotic pancreatitis should be resected with surgical debridement to prevent ARDS and death. Pseudocysts are drained with a needle if they're enlarging or become painful. This can be done percutaneously, but it's more popularly done endoscopically. Here's a CT scan demonstrating a pseudocyst. It happened about four to six weeks after a bout of acute pancreatitis secondary to alcoholism. We're now going to discuss one of my favorite topics, the liver. We're going to go through liver disease and causes of cirrhosis. Chronic liver disease has multiple complications. The first is spider angiometer and palmar erythema. The next is hepatorenal syndrome. In this condition, a change in blood flow and blood vessel tone in the kidneys leads to renal failure. Hepatopulmonary syndrome is when the liver stops clearing vasodilators such as nitric oxide. When you have a buildup of these vasodilators, you get pulmonary edema. This leads to shortness of breath and hypoxia. There's thrombocytopenia, which is thought to be due to hypersplenism. There's even some evidence to show that thrombopoietin is interrupted when chronic liver disease ensues. The liver produces albumin, so you get hypoalbuminemic. Therefore, you lose oncotic pressure, and you have edema and ascites. The liver clears different toxins, so you get asterixis and encephalopathy from the buildup of GABA. The liver also produces our clotting factors. Therefore, without them, you become coagulopathic. And lastly, chronic liver disease leads to portal hypertension, which can lead to the development of varices in the esophagus, stomach, and rectum. You combine varices with coagulopathy, and you now have a combination for disaster. An abdominal paracentesis is performed with new onset of ascites, abdominal pain and tenderness accompanied by fever. Does your patient have low albumin in the acidic fluid? If so, he has portal hypertension from cirrhosis as the etiology of the ascites. But how can you be 100% sure? Well, you should calculate a serum ascites albumin gradient, or the SAG ratio. This is the difference or gradient of albumin between the serum and acidic fluid. Calculating the SAG correlates with specific diseases. When you have a SAG ratio less than 1.1, you know your ascites is coming from either an infection, cancer, or nephrotic syndrome. If your SAG is greater than 1.1, you know your ascites is coming from number one, portal hypertension, CHF, a hepatic vein thrombosis, or constrictive pericarditis. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is an infection of the abdomen without perforation of the bowel. The organisms that cause it are E. coli, being the most common, other gram-negative bacilli, pneumococcus, and anaerobes, which are rare. The best initial test is a cell count of the fluid showing greater than 250 neutrophils. The most accurate test is actually a fluid culture, but we don't wait for the culture to return because it takes too long. Gram stains are sometimes negative, and an LDH is nonspecific. Treatment is always cefotaxime or ceftriaxone. Remember, SVP frequently recurs. When there's ascites and the fluid albumin is low, you must consider prophylactic norfloxacin or Bactrim. Let's talk about treating specific features of cirrhosis. For the ascites and edema, you can give spironolactone and other diuretics such as Lasix. Serial large volume taps are also helpful to reduce the fluid burden. For the coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia, you can give FFP or platelets if bleeding occurs. For the encephalopathy, you can give lactulose, neomycin, or rifaximin. For the hypoalbuminemia, there's no specific therapy. For the spider angiometer and palmar erythema, again, there's no specific therapy. For the varices, you can prophylax with propanolol and ban them via endoscopy. For the hepatorenal syndrome, you can consider somatostatin or midridine. And for the hepatopulmonary syndrome, unfortunately, there's no specific therapy. Alcoholic liver disease is a diagnosis of exclusion, there's no specific therapy, and the most accurate test is a liver biopsy. Here's an example of what a liver would look like after being riddled by alcoholic liver disease. Now remember, 
Alcohol and drugs causing liver disease give a greater elevation in AST compared to ALT. The rule of thumb is viral hepatitis gives you a higher ALT than AST. Alcoholic hepatitis gives you a higher AST than ALT. Binge drinking, that will give you a rise in GGTP. Primary biliary cirrhosis is the most likely diagnosis when you're presented with a woman in her 40s or 50s that complains of fatigue and itching. She has a normal bilirubin, but a sole elevated alkaline phosphatase. Some common features you'll see on exam are xanthalesma or xanthomas, osteoporosis. The most accurate test for primary biliary cirrhosis is a liver biopsy. The most accurate blood test is an anti-mitochondrial antibody, and the treatment is with ursodeoxycholic acid. Here's a liver biopsy from a female who has primary biliary cirrhosis. Note the bile duct inflammation and injury with chronic inflammation. Primary sclerosis and cholangitis is an autoimmune condition that presents with pruritus, elevated alkphos, elevations in GGTP, and elevated bilirubin. The most accurate test is actually an ERCP, not a liver biopsy. It will show beating, narrowing, or strictures in the biliary system, as seen here on the cholangiogram on the right. The treatment is with cholestyramine and ursa deoxycholic acid. Now here's a little tip. Primary sclerosing cholangitis doesn't improve or resolve with the resolution of IBD. Even after a colectomy in ulcerative colitis, patients may still progress to needing a liver transplant in this disease. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a defect in the production of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Look for a combination of liver disease and emphysema in a patient who's young and a non-smoker. The treatment? Replace the enzyme exogenously. Hemochromatosis is a genetic disease leading to the overabsorption of iron in the duodenum. It's a mutation in the C282Y gene. Patients will present in their 50s with mild increases in AST and alkaline phosphatase. Hemochromatosis has a variety of clinical manifestations. Patients will present with erectile dysfunction, fatigue and joint pain from pseudogout, diabetes from deposition of iron in the pancreas, cardiomegaly, skin darkening from all the iron, and, if they're female, amenorrhea. The best initial test is iron studies. This will show an increased serum iron and a decreased iron binding capacity. The most accurate test is a liver biopsy. It will show increased iron. An EKG will show conduction defects. An echocardiogram will show dilated or restrictive cardiomyopathy. And the best therapy for patients with hemochromatosis is phlebotomy. Both chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C are associated with cirrhosis, the development of hepatocellular carcinoma, and polyarteritis nodosa. Chronic hep B patients are those in whom surface antigen is positive for greater than six months. Hepatitis B DNA levels by PCR is the best way to determine viral replication activity. A liver biopsy determines the degree of inflammation and fibrosis, and a biopsy can help you understand the urgency for treatment if fibrosis is present or worsening. We also get repeated biopsies to track their progress. 80% of those patients who contract hep C will have it chronically. Remember, the patients are never symptomatic when they contract the virus. A hep C DNA PCR also helps to determine the disease's activity. The treatment of hepatitis B is through the use of antivirals such as adethavir, lamivudine, telbividine, entacavir, tenofovir, or interferon. The treatment of chronic hep C is a combination treatment of interferon, ribavirin, and a protease inhibitor such as tolapavir or bosepavir. There are many adverse effects to the treatment of hepatitis. Many patients will say that in the short term, the adverse effects are worse than the disease itself, but that's in the short term. Interferon will give you arthralgias, thrombocytopenia, severe depression, and leukopenia. Ribavirin will give you anemia. This is one of the most common findings. Adethavir will give you renal dysfunction. Lamivudine has no adverse effects. Bosepavir gives you anemia, and telapavir will give you a rash. So consider anemia. Ribavirin and bosepavir both do it, so it will be augmented in patients with hep C. 
Wilson's disease is an abnormally decreased copper excretion from a decrease in ceruloplasmin that causes buildup of copper in the liver, kidney, red blood cells, and nervous system. Some neurologic symptoms that can occur are psychoses, tremor, dysarthria, ataxia, or even seizures. You can get a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia and a renal tubular acidosis or even nephrolithiasis. The best initial test is a slit lamp examination looking for Kaiser Fleischer rings. A Kaiser Fleischer ring is a brownish ring around the eye from copper deposition. The most accurate diagnostic test is an abnormally increased amount of copper excretion into the urine after giving penicillamine. Here's a classic example of a Kaiser Fleischer ring with copper deposition in Deschemet's membrane. Penicillamine chelates copper and removes it from circulation. Additional therapies are zinc, which interferes with intestinal copper absorption, and trientine, which is an alternate copper chelating compound. Remember, decreased ceruloplasmin level is not the most accurate test. This is the most common wrong answer. All plasma proteins can be decreased in those with liver dysfunction and cirrhosis. In autoimmune hepatitis, you want to look for a young woman with signs of liver inflammation and a positive ANA. The two antibodies you need to know are the liver kidney microsomal antibody and the anti-smooth muscle antibody. The most accurate diagnostic test is simply a liver biopsy. Treatment is with prednisone and or azathioprine. Here's a classic example of a liver biopsy with autoimmune hepatitis. Notice the massive number of plasma cells and lymphocytes at the portal tract. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, also known as NASH, is an extremely common cause of mildly abnormal liver tests. It's associated with obesity, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, corticosteroid use. The most accurate test is a biopsy which will show microvascular fatty deposits you would find in alcoholic liver disease but without the history of alcohol use. The management is quite simple, weight loss. Here's a classic liver biopsy in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Notice the fatty infiltration of the vesicles in the liver parenchyma. 